Hi. So first of all, I just want to uh, say that this is a new device that we are doing, uh, working from today. So um, hopefully everything does go well. If there are any complications, that is my apologies. Uh, but like, you never really know if something's going to work until you put it out in full force. So, <laughs> so let's hope that all goes well with this one. Uh, so far, so good, though. I, 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 am, I am relatively pleased with, uh, with how things are going. It's much smoother. And all right, so today, um, we're going to, we're just going to see how we're going to work this one. Um, I really am excited about some of the concepts we're going to be looking at potentially today. So um, without further ado, I would like to turn to the last chapter. Oh, no. Exodus 34. <clears throat> I will go ahead and read it if you don't have it readily available because I know that there are some people on the phone today. Um, so this is God's declaration of himself. Uh, that's in uh, verse 6. Uh, this is when uh, he appears, uh, uh, like, or he declares who he is, and this is the, <laughs> which is the same. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, this is the statement. This is, we talked about this on several occasions, but I did want to reiterate it and get it in our minds today. So, without further ado, um, the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am, slow, I am long of nose and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. Okay, so we did break it down before, but I do want to break it down one more time because of certain concepts that we've been addressing in the past. Uh, uh, I had to actually see right now. <laughs> <laughs> Based on concepts that we've been looking at. Um, first of all, when uh, in, let's take a look at it actually in the uh, in your linear. So let's take a look. Uh, Exodus uh, 34. Of 34. And let's get it up here on the screen. This is a lot <laughs> This really is a lot smoother. All right, let's see if we can get this shared. So uh, everyone attending, you can see it, right? Uh, Dad, you would be the one that would be able to see it. I'm not, I'm not sure if you can see it. Uh, if anyone in the meeting is on the online version, can they just tell me real quick that you can see this? There? I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. One second, guys. Hold on. Wait. Well, we're back. Unfortunately, we are having technical difficulties. Um, hopefully, by next week, we can have those technical difficulties rerouted. Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with, uh, I'm going to turn, wait, <clears throat> got one last idea. I got one last idea. It's still recording. Yeah. I'm well, that took a little bit longer than normal to see if I could do this or not, but obviously I can't. So uh, we'll go ahead and continue. I will continue to share the screen just in case the recording happens to pick it up. So we'll go from there. Uh, so it says screen sharing is active. Hopefully everyone will be able to see it online, uh, and I do hope to have this resolved. So um, in verse 6, um, where it, he makes his declaration, it says, there it is. It's this proclamation where it says, Yahweh, Yahweh, God merciful, and so, first of all, before, if you remember right, last time we were talking about God being depicted as a woman. So, this is also a potential way of looking at God as a woman with that very word. I said that Proverbs was the first direct um, inference of this, but there, is, there are slight inferences all throughout the, the Old Testament. 
usually from the standpoint of a mother. Um, the word for merciful here is actually based on the word for womb. And the, so the rahim um, uh, uh, is the word for womb. And then rahum uh, is the word for compassion uh, or like empathy or like uh, yearning or that, that motherly affection. And that is something that uh, usually is only equated to God um, in the text. It's like 75% or something like that. Now, uh, but this is not a direct statement that God has a personified nature as a woman. He just said, it basically just says that his relationship to Israel um, is very similar to that, that compassionate stance. But it can, but the thing is that you have to understand language-wise as well, that we have words that are derived from other words that don't carry the same weight. And that's the argument that goes here. In Hebrew, um, it's potential that it was slightly, uh, um, what, what, I, what's the term, like slightly, that had lost the, the oomph of that statement. I personally believe it has not lost that, but there are arguments to the contrary. Uh, but when it comes to Proverbs, though, and looking at Proverbs, walking, uh, the lady walking in the streets calling out, that is without question um, uh, a representation of God as a woman in that sense. Um, now, I'm not, uh, like, uh, Mom actually brought up a really good, good depiction. Uh, what, what, what was it that you said last week regarding, like, Adam and Eve in the garden? Like, uh, we, oh, that he created us in his image, male and female. And he gave us he gave us each attributes of his because we're in his image. So it it shouldn't I don't believe it should be surprising that God has attributes that we look at as female, whereas we should look at it as females have attributes that are godly, mm-hmm. right. and males have attributes that are godly. So if he has attributes that that we attribute to femininity. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. It's kind of, you know, he has those attributes. He gave them to us Mm -hmm. in his image. I think, um, so I think actually as a, as an interesting point here, um, that when, um, back in uh, Genesis one there, we talked uh, at length about the, that man and woman were created equal. In Genesis 1, it was only after uh, Eve had taken the fruit and given it to Adam that, that they lost that, that equality nature. Um, but in their, in their original uh, creation, according to Genesis 1, they were on an equal playing field. And it, it is interesting to look at it uh, from that perspective. Now, don't get me wrong. God is, like, consistently called a he all throughout, like, all throughout, like, the Old Testament. But it is very intriguing to me that in Proverbs that he is very, very clearly depicted uh, from a womanly standpoint. Um, and I think that that's something that um, I shied away from when, when uh, churches looked at it. I mean, there's like, people just say, oh, it's just the personification of wisdom. But it's like, yeah, but like God is also truth, right? So he's the personification of truth, or he's the personification of love, or he's the personification. Of, so it's like, it, so here, he's the personification of wisdom as a woman. <laughs> so it's, it's it, as a, from, a, from, a, uh, from a feminine standpoint. There we go. Can I, can I? No. <laughs> well, I said, yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> What are you trying to be, Jesus? Yeah, no, no, yeah, Jesus called called him Father, called him Father. However, in in uh, what would in in a parable type of sense, when God's displaying the attributes that we think of as womanly, I can't. I can't personally can't see why the scribes wouldn't wouldn't personify him as a woman because of those attributes. If he if the if the attributes are womanly, it's easier I think for people to understand them when they're put in that category. You know, like a female, like a woman 
a woman seeking after a lover or a woman uh, or a woman uh, with wisdom, you know, who is wisdom. And I don't see, you know, so it, it, it could be both ways, you know, and Jesus referred to him as far. What about, <clears throat> put my two cents in about that, what about when Jesus talked about, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have scattered you like a mother hen gathers her ticks. Uh-huh. Aha! <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. And how about, um, yeah, you also have, like, uh, God, there's a section in Jeremiah, is it Jeremiah? Where he says, I've inscribed you on my hands. And right before that, he was talking about, like, uh, almost like a motherly standpoint. I forget exactly what it is. But it, it is, it, it, it does exist, but like the blatant, the blatant depiction of him as a woman does not occur until Proverbs. Um, but I thought I thought that would be a good point to start off with. There. Yeah. Yeah. Again, too, how as a scribe, how can you, how can you alliterate a being that we can't even conceive of? In, in the flesh, we can't conceive of a being that is all good attributes in one. Mm-hmm. And that great and That's wonderful. That's Our minds point. are just blown by it. God is all things good. He created all, all good comes from him, and he created it, and he is all good things. So, but we, it, how, how would you alliterate it as a scribe? How would you do that to, to try to explain what this being is and what he incorporates? That, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not beyond the realm of reality that they would, you know, that he, would, it could, be, he could be seen as, as womanly or fatherly or, you know, Brother, you know, like God, brotherly as Christ, and husbandly, yeah, and wife, and wifely, which because we he know. is because he's all things. But the one thing he is is great, and we just can't conceive of it. I mm-hmm. don't think. Right. Anything else before we move on? <laughs> no, I was just wondering. Like, not for me. Okay, so that's so we just we just we just entered the whole uh, the whole declaration. Three words. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I did also want to reiterate something. So remember how I said before that there were competing gods in ancient Israel, uh, historically speaking. Uh, two of the gods, uh, the three, that the three males, which were Yahweh, El, and Baal. You also had um, Ishtar, or Inanna, or however you pronounce your name, because the name changed so many times. Uh, and the, but, um, but here you have both of them together. So when it says Yahweh, Yahweh, God, is that merciful? Or, uh, 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 and this, this God, word God is Eid, which is El. It's the name. Uh, it's the generic term for God. Um, Eloh is, the, is another one. Um, but uh, and that's not plural notice. I just said a law. Uh, and the, but it's interesting that both are paired right there. It's like saying, I am the one and the same when it comes to this. And then you have the next word after that is a feminine perspective of this. So I think it's interesting that all three are there. Um, and the, so what I mean is like you have Yahweh, then you have El, and then you have the word for, uh, based on the word womb, like the com- womb-like compassion. And it, it's like almost like they're combining all three of the competing gods there. Baal was kind of four, and, uh, but, but he, came, he, he came later. And I, I, I just wanted to mention that particular aspect. I thought oh, it's interesting to have all three right there. Um, <clears throat> also, um, you have, uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, uh, that he's uh, of long nostrils. He's slow to anger. <laughs> um, so uh, for everyone who can see my screen, this means long, this means nostrils. And then you have, um, 
of great uh, goodness and truth. This is where we get the word amen from. If you remember Jonah, we were talking about Amitai, and this is Amet here. And then, so it's talking about, like, uh, so you're having goodness, right? But isn't it interesting that the word goodness is the same as the word mercy? Hmm. So, <laughs> so keeping mercy, keeping goodness, it's the same word. So in Hebrew, I'm trying to describe it for those who can't see. In Hebrew, um, it, it, it'll say, like, of great height. And, and that means something having to do with purity and goodness and, and, and love. And, 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 uh, and mercy is part of that. So of abounding height and then keeping height for thousands. So I'm good and I preserve it for, the, for thousands. Now, keep in mind the word thousands there, okay? Um, so the forgiving iniquity and sin, uh, and, but by no means, uh, but by no means claim the guilty, and then visiting that sin to the third and to the fourth, okay? So what it actually means, like, to the thirds and fourths. So anyway, now turn with me to the last chapter of Proverbs. Oh, wait, no, it's not the last chapter. It's 30. It's 30, sorry. And, uh, all right, I'll stop sharing because there's no need to talk about that. Uh, hopefully it actually does come across the recording, but we'll see. Um, okay. Um, I'm looking where it would be best to start. Okay. Okay, 15, 30, 15. The leech has two suckers that cry out more, more, or give. Um, there are three things that are never satisfied. No, four that never say enough. Do you see where I'm going here? The grave, the barren womb, the thirsty desert, the blazing fire. The eye that mocks a father and despises a mother's instructions will be plucked up by ravens of the valley and eaten by vultures. There are three things that amaze me. No, four things that I don't understand. How an eagle glides through the sky, how a snake slithers on a rock, how a ship navigates the ocean, how a man loves a woman. And I... I, I uh, an adulterous woman consumes the man, then wipes her mouth and says, what's wrong with that? There are three things that make the earth tremble. No, four it cannot endure. A slave who becomes a king, an overbearing fool who prospers, a bitter woman who finally gets a husband, a servant girl who supplants her mistress. There are four things on earth that are small but unusually wise, and they aren't strong, but they serve food all summer. Um, well, in here, uh, wait, there's a Connie's. Connie's uh, are powerful, but they make their homes among the rocks. Hydraxes is another word. Um, locusts, they have no king, but they march in formation. Lizards, they are easy to catch, but they're placed even in king's palaces. There are three things that walk with stately stride. No four that spread about. The lion, king of animals, who won't turn aside for anything. The strutting rooster. <laughs> A male goat, a king as he leads his army. If you have been a fool by being proud or plotting evil, cover your mouth in shame. As the beating of cream yields butter, and striking the nose causes bleeding, so stirring up anger causes quarrels. And then look at right after that, you got the sayings of King Lemuel. The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message which his mother taught him. Oh, my son... O son of my womb, O son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. So I, I'm going to stop there. 
but I don't know if the implications of what I just read are like smacking you in the face right now. From, at least to those who've been like in attendance, like for a grand majority of our gatherings. Any, anything that strikes you from everything that we've been covering. I'll start three and four to the third and the fourth. That's interesting that this is like repeated like several times inside of this chapter to the third and to the fourth. Um, so when it talks about he shows mercy on the thousands, but yet he, but yet he visits the sins of fathers to the thirds and the fourths. So there's a lot of debate that goes on there. A lot of uh, people uh, I've yet to really hear though a, a really uh, until recent, relatively recently, um, a, a really sound reason why uh, it wasn't showing that God was a God of like supreme anger that will blaze his fire of anger at any given moment. And uh, think about it, though. He shows forgiveness of iniquity to the thousand, but he will, not go the un- he will not let the unrighteous go unpunished to the third and the fourth, but he relents. Like, he is a relenting God. Um, he doesn't wipe things out because he shows mercy to the thousand. Um, we're talking, there's the, there's a large conception that the thousands also mean thousands of generations. So when you're talking about the, um, so he shows mercy to the thousands, meaning from like now until forever long. But if he do something that so egregiously uh, hinders like his love for others, he will stamp it out, um, or or he will or he will continue to visit what you uh, what you have done in order to create such an egregious nature, um, and. The, but the thing is, though, it's a stark contrast to the thousands aspect. Um, but you have the three and the four versus the thousands, and it just shows how full of compassion and heaven he is. And he is, um, anyway, uh, so that's one thing. And to say three and four, uh, three, no four, six, but seven, <laughs> like, that, that's a very common theme. If you remember, what was it, the things that, the, of the most detestable, it's six, but no, seven. <laughs> but it's three and four is the most common thing that you'll find. I think Jeremiah talks about it as well. Um, and maybe I don't know, someone else does. But, um, the, but three and four is pretty common. And, the, and it's funny, too, that when you're saying here, hmm, the, there are three things that are never satisfied, no four that never say enough. And it's so funny that the first thing is the grave with, or Sheol, which God hates. He hates it. Um, he hates death. And uh, it's and it's funny that that's the first thing that gets mentioned. And then you have the barren womb. It's interesting that you have womb mentioned here. Uh, and there are some implications there. Uh, I think there are many different ways that can be taken. Um, uh, but like the barren womb, it's like it's never stated. It's never stated. It's like I don't have a, a, like a single one. And here is like here's God yearning for His own portion. Like that. That's been a major thing that we've been looking at as well. The thirsty desert. Uh, we were talking about the wilderness. We were talking uh, like the thing and how Azazel. Uh, like if you look at it as a spiritual being, is always thirsty for more. Um, if you look at it as just like a, uh, like a place, like a wilderness, it's still, it just eats up things. Uh, you go, and then you have the blazing fire, which is like the stark contrast like when you're talking about being in God's presence, that, that thing, that God is so often equated to fire. Other spiritual beings as well, but anyway. Oh, and the, the word for blazing. Um, uh, when it's talking about blazing fire, remember when uh, you are angry, uh, it, instead of being a short nose, uh, it says that your uh, nostrils are burning. And so that is supreme anger. And so they're actually saying blazing. So a blazing fire, it also has to do with rage. Um, so, so, so anyway, um, 
there are three things that amaze me, no four things I don't understand. Uh, I love how the last, so the, it, so you had the blazing fire, which was the last of the, la, uh, the previous four, the blazing fire. The next four, the last one is how a man loves a woman. Uh, then you have, um, then you have 23. The, the next four are a servant girl who supplants her mistress. This is me. Um, and there's something about the lizards. I forget, I, I'm, I'm trying to lose some place, but they're, uh, lizards are easy to catch, but they're found even in king palaces. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are three things that work with this stately stride, uh, a king as he leads his army. Um, it, it, so these things always end in like a strong statement, um, but it, it's funny like how they're easy to catch, but they're found even in the king's palaces. Um, I have heard, or I have at least gotten the implication from uh, another source that that these final the like the fourth statement of each of these has something to do with God's relationship with His people. Um, and so if you, if you look at it from like a servant girl who supplants her mistress, uh, like think about it, what does God do but elevate us? Like, and he, and he even dies in order to, he, he dies in order to bring us up. Um, and like, and his, what he says in uh, some locations, I can't think about it off the top of my head, how we're like his crown jewel. <laughs> and it says like that we are his, his, Pride and joy, <laughs> and, it, and it's interesting the the, the whole the whole thing of that. Um, you have the lizards are easy. There's something about like that, like you get you get people selected from like the com most common of situations that, to be in the king's court. It was something like that, something along those lines. Um, but it is interesting that it's. It, I think it has something to do with like there are so many like. But today there are billions of people, but yet some of them can be found. They're just generic people. Yet some of them can be found in the most amazing mm. situations. Like and the um, and then you have a king as he leads his army, and then uh, it's, it's just really interesting that. And then in the beginning of thirty one, you have uh, the sayings of King Lemuel. Lemuel is a potential pseudonym for Sam. Uh, for, uh, for Solomon. Uh, and the, it, it, um, the, it's, it's heavily attested. I, I would say that it's more like an 80% chance that it's Solomon here. Um, and so the sayings of King Solomon basically contain this message, which his mother taught him. And if you look at the very beginning, remember we focused on Proverbs where it says, my son, listen to these things. My son, if you follow these paths, and all, like this is, and, this, and here we end with it saying, my son, O oh son of my womb, O oh son of my vows. Just a lot to take in there. And this is like, do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. And there is basically don't go by the wayside and talk about the multiple layers of things. If this is God talking to, to his children in that sense, this is also an inference of don't be led astray. What is one of the most common themes in the Old Testament is how they're led astray and prostitute themselves. Um, as women, in that womenly sense, but then you also have how Israel, like, just ran off, like, with whatever, like, beautiful thing came their way from another kingdom. It's a very common theme, and so now we're looking at it from God takes, sorry, what? Oh, oh, sorry, I'm just talking to people. Um, one second. Uh, one second, guys. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is interesting, the, um, uh, 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 cool. so, we got the, um, 
So it is interesting, don't waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. Um, and it's just so interesting that instead of Israel taking the feminine role, uh, it, they're taking the masculine role and are being led away by, by uh, women. Uh, it, it's really interesting because like, usually God takes the masculine perspective. And it's, it, it's really interesting. So um, anyway, um, so it is... And then you have, like, the wife of noble character. All right, let's do it this way. Verse 10. Pay attention. Imagine God being equated to a wife here. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, and she'll greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's like a merchant ship, bringing her food from a bar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girl. She goes to inspect the field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. A vineyard. <laughs> She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her aunt burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. Um, and the, the Hebrew actually means scarlet, um, or like, uh, like the red threaded, red threaded clothes. Um, this, this is special word in Hebrew that means particularly of a red thread. Um, she makes her own bed spreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where she sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She's clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks her words, her wife. <laughs> And she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deed publicly declare her praise. So, um, the only thing that just doesn't fit that, but in, in my experience, the Lord is that, yeah. But, but we're going to get into something interesting here. We'll come back to this. Just be aware that it doesn't always mesh. Um, but remember what I said before that you have the, the multiple layers of things. The Jewish. The Jewish perspective of Song of Songs is that the woman is God. But what woman would be uncertain of chasing after? Like, what woman, in terms of, like, if that were God, why would that woman hesitate? And I think it's interesting that there's so much of a mix of ideas. It, 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 it's really it, it, it's fascinating. Um, but everything up to verse 30 and 31 are like, like in your face, like godly nature. And it's like, it's in your face. So even these two verses here not meshing, it's like, come on. <laughs> it's like, it's really, it's a model, but then God models things for us as well. What is it? Like, uh, Christ is like, be like me. Like, uh, like, uh, it basically, yeah, or, or there's a policy to be like Christ. Anyway, but you know what I'm saying. We're supposed to model after him. And so it's like, so then here a woman is being said to, like, like fear the Lord. Um, to, it, it, anyway, it's really interesting. So now, the next book in the Ketavim is Job. And so just take everything we talked about with Proverbs, Put it away, and we will come back. <laughs> so, 
But I did have a question. Um, does anyone have anything they wanted to say before we moved on to Job real quick? We're going to do the hook of Job. <laughs> it's only like 40-some chapters. I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm only pointing out a few interesting details. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know what you were saying there about will God be in a, uh, referred to as a woman or using that as an analogy. That, doesn't, that makes total sense to me, seeing that God made man in his image, and when it says man, it's you, man. It's not just uh, the male versus the female. So he's, uh, like your mother was saying, there's a combination of uh, attributes that uh, you can liken various things to. Because, like uh, like he says, that you're not complete until you become one with one another, and therefore you have the uh, well balanced, more rounded uh, characteristics as a, as a team rather than rather than the uh, individual. Not to mention, uh, John sixteen or seventeen, when Christ is praying. God as a human is praying, fearing the Lord. And he says, me and you, and you and me and us and them. There's a massive overlay there. <laughs> but yet there's individual needs as well. So I think it's interesting, like, looking at it in Proverbs. Like, remember when I said before that things start to get a little bit haywire in terms of description starting in Proverbs? Um, that was last week I said that. Um, and this is where it really, you can start to see it. it uh, Makes sense. But, um, anything else? Oh, no, what, no, I actually did have something to say. Um, so I was taking, in my Hebrew class, we mentioned it this week, uh, it has nothing to do with Proverbs, but Israel has a tendency of being feminine and masculine. Up in the Israel had a, <laughs> I didn't quite hear what that, you said. Reference as a male and as a female in the grammar. It can be like typically, typically, the land of Israel is feminine, um, but not always. And you, all, we were looking at that this week. It's like the land of Israel can be feminine, but it's usually uh, seen uh, when you're talking about like Israel, the man, he's masculine, but like Israel in terms of God's relationship with them, like the people of Israel, it's like half and half. And then, it, and the grammar just willy nilly changes, and it can, and it's referred to in the grammatical structure as a male and a woman, um, uh, because in Hebrew, um, if anyone studied like Spanish or French or German before, you, you you know how you can have like feminine endings and masculine endings to like verbs and nouns. Uh, Hebrew takes it to, to the second level, <laughs> where it's like you got masculine and feminine second person in masculine and feminine third person, which means you. So whenever God says you, it's like sometimes it comes across as a feminine, and then sometimes it comes across as a, ma a masculine. And it, it, it's really interesting because it's really a mix, and uh, it could be, and it could just like change from one chapter to the next. Um, and so I think that just goes in, plays into what we're just talking about right now, like how God can easily switch roles in that regard. So... Oh, not to mention a servant girl who's a pastor mistress. That's very Christ-like as well. <laughs> like that, because we're talking about like there will be a servant. Moses talked about it. Like they're like talking about the future days of the servant. Um. So. All right. Anything else before we hit Job in the face? I'm sorry, Joe, but hasn't he taken enough abuse? <laughs> Not yet. We haven't read it. <laughs> this is terrible. I'm, okay, now, first of all, let's talk about historicity. Job is like the... If Jonah was like the oddball in terms of the 12 prophets, Jonah, uh, Job is like the oddball book. 
it is the it is known as being one of uh, Esther has a, another way of being kind of an oddball book, but Job is like the oddball book. Um, the there there there's evidence in terms of grammar that uh, it was written much much earlier uh, than any of the other books. Um, if you're talking about a historic, if you're talking about like the historical like location of where we can like like go back to. Now that doesn't. But the thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that we can mimic old grammar as well. Like we can mimic Shakespeare in English. Um, if you study the grammar structure, um, you can mimic uh, what that can be like. Um, and so there's there's debate on that. Uh, there's a lot of consensus saying that no, Job was written much earlier. That this was a comp by the time they came back from exile, it was it was already in existence, but it was more like they just tossed that book in there. Uh, it was a well-known book. That's that's the theory. This is a theory, okay? Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up in terms of like we're talking about in the eyes of the scribes, it's like I have to mention this stuff. In this sense, I'm, I'm trying to refrain from like scientific, like uh, archaeological uh, things, but you have to understand like um, there is division even among like uh, like rabbis and stuff like that. Exactly where Job gets placed in things. Um, now, uh, another thing too is Job was more than likely heavily altered as soon as Elihu makes an appearance. Um, when that the last friend, like he just magically appears out of nowhere, uh, like that one, uh, that particular section is considered an addition. Um, we were looking at Isaiah and how there were certain sections that were add-ons, and more than likely that section was also an add-on. Um, it, de it doesn't limit the the veracity of the of the statement, but it, it is interesting, like to see how texts have like shaped and evolved over time. Um, now, this is also the only clear cut, uh, except for Micaiah, but Micaiah's version was like, like this compared to Job's version being like that, of the divine counsel. And you have to understand that at this point in time, in terms of what the scribes saw, um, they also had those other books that we referenced before, such as the book of Enoch. Um, and Enoch goes into detail about like the traditional perception of what the divine council was like, how things were at the beginning of time, and the um, there was all, there was that social connotation as well. Uh, but the thing is, though, uh, that that's just really interesting just to look at it from that perspective, and it's still part of our scripture today. And there's a lot that can be said about it. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail with it, but just think of everything we have been covering for 26 weeks now. Um, there, like for 26 weeks, yeah, I had to chat. I have it written up on my calendar. Um, so for 26 weeks, we have been looking at the various structures of things. And so here we are looking at the Divine Council portrayal in Job. So uh, here we go. <clears throat> uh, we are going to... We, we know the story. I think everyone here now knows the story of Job. So we're going to look at clear-cut things. Verse 6. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked the accuser. We're, we talked about the name uh, of the accuser. Uh, the Christian church, um, as well as some forms of Judaism, equate this to a demonic being that is of evil inclination. And in tra a tra now you've got to understand, this is another history thing that we do have to address. Jewish thought has changed drastically in the last 2,000 years as a result of the, uh, the destruction of the temple. Um, the the way of thought, the way of thinking has drastically altered as the diaspora went all throughout Europe and then they just like, like uh, they still, they were already at that state before, but because of like the Roman persecutions and stuff like that, it, it really like, and they were integrated with different cultures and they got different ideas. 
But if you're looking at the actual way they were thinking back then, there is a clear-cut difference. And the reason I say that was that rabbi that I was showing you before, uh, Friedman, but like, if you remember in that video, he lamented that. <laughs> like, he said, if some rabbi, like, if ra some rabbis were to say this, he goes, that's so not Jewish. And, and, and that's where he's coming from as well. Um, and the, so this, this is a, this is pretty well founded. Um, but it is a hard thing, I think, we were talking before about, like, the, the breaking of, like, our, our mindset of, like, how we've been, how we've grown up. Uh, do you, do you, do you remember that at the very beginning we talked about, like, let's travel back in time and try to see it from that perspective. Um, the divine council is seen as God's great, uh, like, his, his force. Like, he, he asks their advice. And I think it just really hits our heads wrong when we think of that. But in scripture, he asks the advice of those in the divine council. Um, the Christian ideology is that uh, once, I'm just going to mention it now, we will delve into that later. When Christ was, son, uh, was called the one begotten son, uh, the, this brought him to the, um, he is God, don't get me wrong, but his experience as a human has been more of a, of a council member presence than any other divine council member, I guess you could say. And we are called to be the same. Uh, this is where the marriage thing gets into great detail. This is just a preview of coming attractions when we look at how the New Testament addresses things. What I just said is very much considered heresy within, uh, within, certain, uh, within certain traditionalist factions. Um, the, the, uh, I will just I'm not going to name a few because I don't want to, but there are, uh, uh, they're, they're out there. And it's actually a majority. But when you actually look at what the, the uh, scripture actually says, it's very clear. I do personally believe that having grown up after 2,000 years um, with different traditions coming into the, the way, uh, I was talking at church about like the propaganda machine. It's funny, it's like how the propaganda machine can easily twist things in the church as well. And here we are, and we are looking at things that the Bible is clearly saying, and we're like, uh, my, there's a disconnect between what the scripture is saying and what I, I hear when I go to church or something like that. That, that very, and it's like, what, so what I just said about us being elevated to the level of Christ in the divine council chamber is, it is heresy, according to some, and the majority of those uh, uh, within traditional inspection. So I did want to disclaim that. I did want to talk about that. Now, um, I'm sure I'm wrong somewhere as well, and I'm saying this also for the online community, if anyone does happen to come across this. I, I'm sure I'm wrong at, uh, in some verses as well, but I do believe personally that um, because I have had um, discussions with people um, on, on various levels, and the I personally believe that there's more direct evidence of what we're talking about in this group than there is when it comes to uh, various other things. An example of this, and we'll talk about this, but is uh, God's immutable nature. Um, but that, that's a, a subject for a complete other day. Um, we're talking about how God changes his mind, uh, all that stuff. But anyway, that was enough rambling. I did have to disclaim that because now let's look at Satan. So, uh, <laughs> what? But the, the, that being heresy, that, that God wants us to, to, what, work with him and be with him, it goes back to the first lie, to the great lie. Yes, yeah, they God really say, I know. Doesn't want you, he doesn't want you to be like that. Yep, yep, yeah, like, so I, I would think, I, mean, I actually mentioned that. Uh, Satan, I mean, the, the, the adversary said, he doesn't want you to be like that. Did God really say? Yeah. He didn't say it, but he inferred it. Yeah. The uh, the, yeah, the thing the thing that I see. Go ahead. Yeah, the adversary's lie is that God doesn't want you to do what people are saying it's heresy for us to believe. You know, and the, like He doesn't want you to do what He wants you to do. That's the lie. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to be like him. No, he knows. <laughs> it would be, he knows that 
as soon as you start doing the things that you want to do, you'll be like him. Right, exactly. And but he doesn't want you to be like him. It, but the so, thing is, though, is like the moment that you start doing the things that you want to do, thinking that you're going to be more like him, you're you, not. You, you aren't. You're not. <laughs> you're the, it's the well, opposite. The great lie is the great lie is mm-hmm. that it's heresy to think that that y- you could be a part of God's council. What, what did you have to say, Dan? The, the thing that gets me is from the from the garden. That's what God wanted. He wanted to have Adam and Eve as and all humanity as his partners, or right. his partners in his relationship. Not whether we'll ever be greater than God or anything like that, but he wants us to be as the uh, like the other like it's describing here, part of the, the council, part of his family, part of his uh, his fellowship. He's not looking to you know. The tradition, I guess it's the traditional stuff that you were talking about. One minor thing that I'd like to point out, I don't think that you had it in your translation, Joel, but in the New King James, it refers to, there's a footnote here where it talks about, um, in verse 6, and they came and presented themselves before Yahweh, and, oh, Satan, yeah. and Satan was among them. But the footnote says it was literally the adversary. Oh, and if you look, no, it's the adversary, according to this. And I have a feeling that can be translated several ways. And I'm trying to remember, isn't, yeah, isn't there another place in Scripture where I, I'm trying to remember where it talks about God wanted the adversary? And he was like the uh, uh, like in a courtroom kind of thing. They needed somebody to defend the client and another one to prosecute. And that's kind of what I think is happening here. It's not necessarily Satan as you know the the evil one. It's somebody uh, being contrary to God's will, normal will, in order to test. Can I say one thing before anything? By the way, I just I, I'm going to lose it. Otherwise, um, really quick, when the serpent says that he knows that you'll be like God, um, the word uh, for like it's not even a word, it's a preposition. That means the same as as in terms of like equality but go ahead what mm-hmm. yeah and also the 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 argument against the the adversary being the the great evil power that we think of traditionally as satan is it isn't i'm trying to think of the scriptures or or where that god doesn't he doesn't deal with evil in his presence. He's used, he's not in the presence of evil. I don't know. I don't know that. that I, I know what you're saying. I can't remember the scripture that's used for that, but I don't. I don't think that's true, though. Because yeah, it's the so thing about Christ, when Christ was on the cross, and. Uh, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was because God couldn't look on sin. But if God is everywhere and in every place, he's got to be able to look on sin. Because <laughs> it's, all, it's, among, it's all over the What? Christ was among sin. Yeah. It's a common misconception that God could not be in the presence of sin. His only thing was, if he was in the presence of sin, he would obliterate it. So he doesn't want to. So, so, so he came as a human, yeah. and right, yeah, and, and touched as a human. Like he he touched someone physically and said, <laughs> and notice it was the un- uncleanliness fled from his presence. It was like mm-hmm. it was like even though he was in human form, like the the uncleanliness could not ha- the uncleanliness could not handle being in his presence. It wasn't him right. that, that couldn't be in right. the uncleanliness. Yeah, that makes that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And yeah. the so that's so like it's a different it's a it's a mind switch there. It's a God that he yeah. And it's funny that he allows the uncleanliness to exist and the evil to exist. And it's funny because it goes back to what the end of Proverbs is talking about, like how that woman will um uh, work a thread. And, and it's 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 really that's, a, that's an interesting cultural implication as well, but I'm not going into it. Yeah, um, that's, that makes better sense because it just it just seems that, you know, with God being as powerful as he is, that he could handle 
evil. Right. Well, when you think about it, God's spirit is throughout the world at this point, and Christians around the world. And if that's the case, he is in the presence of sin all the time. <laughs> in that sense, right? No, absolutely. I mean, no, uh, not necessarily. I I you know, I'm not not necessarily that's an individual Christian, but what, are the, what the people, the Christians that are around others that are sinning, and then of course the inherent sin that is in each of us. But yeah, that's, that's why. That's why you have the guilt complex in Christianity. And to see what that has to go. The guilt wait, 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 Joel, just please say that again a little slower because you could break it up. A guilt complex, guiltiness, that oh. constant and unrelenting feeling of guilt that pervades the Christian church. I honestly believe is a hindrance. Um, because it's like, now don't get me wrong, it's like, we're not to like continue like living in sin, but like, it's that constant, you gotta, you, you gotta repent, 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 and it's like, even after you're baptized and you realize that you're doing wrong and you're struggling with something, it's like, well, you gotta repent, and it's like, yes, but it's, it's, a, it's a deterrent, it, it, it's a massive deterrent, and I've seen it recently as well. And the, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's really, that, that's the whole thing. It's just like when it comes to like God's presence in evil, a lot of people seem to think that when God is being forgiving, um, like uh, he will only have his eye on those who deserve it, basically. Like a lot of people say, uh, how can God forgive me for these things? Because they have that conception that God would not be in their presence. And it's so contrary. Well, it look goes at back you, to that. Well, look at jo the story of Job. God was dealing with Job the whole time when he was rebelling. And he was saying, get away from me. I'm going to go to Tarsus. You, say, you mean uh, Jonah? I'm sorry, Jonah. Sorry. We're talking about Job here. Sorry, I meant Jonah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, but he was being rebellious, uh, putting away from God. He uh, did everything he could to get away. But at the same time, God was dealing with him. Mm -hmm. And was that not sin, what jo Job was doing when God told him a direct command, go do it, and he's a prophet, and he says no? You know, I'm just, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add, it doesn't, it's not logical. What? What? I said it's not logical. I heard you. It's not logical. And you also have God works with rebellious people. Samson. We talked about Samson yeah. and about Israel. How all of Israel. Israel. All of Israel. Uh, like, uh, the, the exceptions were the few. The most of them were rebellious. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so, when we're talking about, like, this whole thing here, I, I wanted to, unfortunately... Short, but mm -hmm. I did. I I do hope that we can definitely take at least a small look, and I'll say what it is, and we can explain it for those who cannot see. Um, <laughs> those of us who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And you guys are frozen uh, on the screen right now. <laughs> I know. Hopefully, this works this time. Um. So, uh, read your sixth verse. One day the members of the heavenly court, what does yours say? Wonderful. When ah. Jesus came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So what is the term for the angels or the divine council members of the heavenly host here? The actual Hebrew is sons of God. And that's what the King James yeah. says. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I heard that. At least one of them got it. But, um, yeah, the sons of God. And so it said, okay, yes, so the sons of God were actually among the divine council. And so we're talking about, like, the sons of God marrying the daughters of men in Genesis 6. We talked about, like, the, the sons of God in, in various epics. Only a few humans were listed as sons of God in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, and, like, um, uh, no, it's actually son of man. What is it? Elijah was son of man. Son of man. Son of man. Um, and which is the daughters of men type of uh, implication. And then Christ was the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. 
and then you have, and then he uh, adopts them. It, it's such a cool, cool thing. Anyway, um, and then, yeah, sure, right. Everything we said about Satan, uh, the traditional Jewish thing is just, it just means the finger pointer. Saying, really, though? <laughs> like, for real? <laughs> and he only likes you because of this. I mean, if you do this, I'm sure. And God takes his advice. He listens to this person's counsel. If you look at things from a Christian perspective, it's like, why would God even listen to Satan and even deal with them? And this is like, the, now, now, there's a lot of things saying, did Job actually happen? Goes back to like Jonah. I think it's a new point in this sense. The, the, the point here is that God has a counsel in terms of what the, what the scripture is saying and that we are invited to join his counsel. One last thing before we, uh, before we head into a break. Um, we were talking about that God, that we would be like or as God, okay? Uh, it's a very simple, it's just a single letter in Hebrew. <laughs> um, and I just wrote it. <laughs> Like a C. And um, the I did want to mention. So what did he tell Adam and Eve to do was rule and subdue the earth. And why did Christ come down? He came down as a human. And what's going to happen in Revelation? He comes down on earth, and he reigns as a king. And yet we're his bride. Implications of that, and the bride, and so will the man leave his father and mother and cling to his life. That is a major elevating statement to say that we are the bride of Christ. Um, and so to, to limit it in its full force is detrimental, in my opinion, to God's desire to be as close to us as possible. And, uh, I, and I think it's something that we as Christians should not be afraid of. Um, it, and and I, it, that's so much easier said than done, especially with the tradition that pervaded for the past two thousand years. And I, I just I just wanted to share that. What, so does anyone have what, any what are you? What, what is the topic specifically? What do you mean by that? What was Being elevated to God's level? Oh, okay. Because you you even shied away from the concept of actually not being God. And it's like. No, in, in a sense, it's like on earth, yes. Not the heavenly domain. Like, I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about the expanse of the cosmos. I'm not talking about, but there is a plan for him to join us and make us part of him. Right, and it's the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah, the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah. Exactly. And I think when people, like, actually recognize that, it really livens things up saying, and then I'm baffled by his grace, thinking of the things I have done and fallen short on, but then that's the serpent in my head saying, did God really say that? Yep. And, and he really did. <laughs> so, yes, he really did. And, and I have yet to really be among, um, like, uh, it's, I will say that that opinion is in the absolute minority. Um, oh, yeah. I would say, you know, well, what? Just read, what is it, John 13, 14, 15, the prayer that Christ said. He says, the Father, in me, you are in me and I am in you. And he prayed that we would all, his followers would all be one as they are one. And, and we are supposed to be in Christ the same way. So if we're supposed yeah. to be one with Christ and Christ is one with God, what does that make it? You know, I mean, it's we got a long way to go, and it won't happen until the new heavens and the earth are here, and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think that's the ultimate destiny, the ultimate goal. Yeah. At least then in this segment. Like, I'm sorry. Then you have guys like well, then you have guys like Paul writing that. I hasn't seen nor ear heard nor entered into the hearts of men the thing that God has prepared. Yeah. Entered into the exactly. hearts of men. Yeah, yeah. 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 and it's and it's so uh it's so amazing, it's hard to believe. It is hard to believe. But uh but the Bible sort of seems to indicate it from the Genesis to Revelation. Really. That's the whole thing God's doing. I love how the Bible project talks about like a, it's a unif that the Bible is a unifying story that leads to Jesus. 
That's right. And it really is. It Keep is. The theme just throughout. Yep. And yep. It, I like this discussion. <laughs> so, um, I, I do think it's good and wise to actually take like a small five minute break. There's uh, yeah. hopefully I would like to see how much more ground we can cover today. I'm not I'm not limiting discussion. What I'm just saying is let's just make it like a five minute break so that we can have more time together. So like yep. we'll be back on the, uh, the other side of things. Uh, this is like an awesome discussion and. Um, uh, if anyone's listening and believes about what we're saying is absolute heresy, I, I do, I do. Uh, <laughs> Read the Bible. I do. Uh, I do yeah. have a request to actually look further. <laughs> well, anyway. All right, so that's, uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side of this and turn off the recording. Well, we are back. We are back. Um, we were talking during break, and there are a couple points I did want to make here that are, uh, that are rather important. Um, one thing is, We were talking about like how uh, we choose what is uh, good and bad. We choose what's right and wrong um, all the way back in Genesis. And that also comes to how we look at God from a Christian perspective. And I think that this whole thing with um, this whole thing of like how dare we equate ourselves to God's level, it's like even though it's quite clear that God himself is saying to us, join me. <laughs> come with me. I want you with me. Um, and we don't dare do so, which is interesting if we look at ourselves from the woman's perspective in Tug of Songs, but we'll get to that later. Um, the, I was talking before about the mental barriers uh, that we have. And I wanted to say one thing. At least everyone in this uh, gathering right now, and I'm sure everyone in, uh, who is watching online, is, is coming in with preconceived uh, notions. Um, I have, I, everyone here is. And the, like the, we, we grew up in a certain uh, way with a certain way of thinking, even though there were variances. But here we are like really looking at things from a completely different perspective. And, it, it, and it's, it's definitely, it's, it's mind boggling at times. And I, and I think we're all battling, we're all battling in terms of like seeing things from this perspective. But I will say, ever since I have started to see things in this way, my love for God has never been stronger. And I think it's so interesting that the human made barriers that separate us from God calling to us from the streets um, is, is really, it's funny because it's human made. That, those barriers and those things are the ones that separate us from realizing the full potential of what it means to be a Christian um, and the full potential even for the Jewish people that's like that is what their calling is as well but God said I'm I, I'm gonna branch out here <laughs> and, and, and so it, it's um, talking that we're just talking about Christ saying how much I wish I could uh, hide you like a head um, and the, so it's, it's, I, I personally, uh, after having done uh, a lot of like, uh, study and, and tearing down of my own barriers, um, as someone who has gone through that, I can say that without a doubt, I'm more Christian than ever. Like that is, there's no, there's so, there's no doubt. Like it's evident in how, like who I am today. And, um, and I think that some, that fear of tearing down barriers like that will only lead to us going astray is once again that serpent coming back to us and saying, did God really say that? And, uh, and I've often heard, often heard, um, when I would be uh, talking with theological discussions back when I was a teenager, uh, talking with people, and they would say, yeah, the scripture says this, but what it actually means is this. And it's like, I'm sorry, I do honestly believe that, yes, while the Bible does have multiple layers to things, there are certain concrete things that do not, like, that are not a question. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's sad because, once again, there's a barrier. Um, so I do hope that, that things... I do, I, I am so grateful to be a part of a gathering such as this because that allows us to really, as, as like a, 
coming together and seeing these things. We're actually seeing them and, and experiencing them. Uh, I mean, I can just think of, like, being in church and then seeing things on the screen, like, from the New Testament, like, during a sermon, and, like, giggling with joy because of the things we're talking about in this, in this gathering. Um, it, it, it's amazing because it's, like, how everything just moves together. I go back to Proverbs, and it says how a woman uh, knows how to work with the, this wine or this bread. But anyway, um, so... That said, back to Job. Chapter 7. We, already, we, already, we, we know what the concept is of one. Like, we already talked about what the implication is of Satan, uh, of, the, of the divine being. Okay. Um, so Job is lamenting his life. And all right. Let's start at verse 9. I know it's in the middle of a section, but I want to lead into it. Just as a cloud dissipates and vanishes, those who die will not come back. They're gone forever from their home, never to be seen again. We're talking about the concept of death in the Old Testament, right? I cannot keep from speaking. I must express my anguish. My bitter soul must complain. Look at the Hebrew poetry there. That's, that's really strong there. Like, I can't keep from speaking. I must express my anguish, amplification. My bitter soul must complain. <laughs> that's, the, that's the third thing. My bitter body like, must, must complain. Verse 12 of chapter 7. Am I a sea monster or a dragon that you must place me under guard? <laughs> I, I just I giggle when I see this section <laughs> because of what we talked about uh, early on when it came to like the tiny and in the in the chaos monster and, the, and <laughs> I just love it. Am I a sea monster that must be contained? <laughs> And then it talks in other sections of scripture of like how, how God bound or created that sea monster and, and it's like it's just really uh yeah, it's interesting. And like it's interesting that it's also verse twelve of chapter seven. Hmm <laughs> that particular statement. Anyway, um the, the anyway, um I'm looking here. So then he complains for a while, and then you got his response. Uh, there's a few uh, other places, I think, or notes. Uh, chapter 10, verse 9. <clears throat> turn me back to dust so soon. You guided my conception and formed me in the womb. You clothed me with skin and flesh and you knit my bones and sinews together. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing love. My life was preserved by your care. Yet your real motive, your true intent, was to watch me. And if I sinned, you would not forgive my guilt. I, I think it's interesting his emotional roller coaster here. Uh, first of all, the the whole conception thing, from dust to dust, and uh, and so he's again talking about death here. And I love this this biting statement from Job. Now, don't get me wrong. When Jonah had that biting statement, he was completely out of place. Um, that when he says like I knew that you were, yes I I, I want to die. <laughs> that whole that whole section in chapter four. But here it's just like, it's so biting. Like, I know what you wanted all along was just to watch me and toy with me. That is something I myself have battled. That is why when I read Job, it's like I can relate to, to these feelings. I haven't lost everything like, uh, like Job is depicted. But, I, but the thing is, though, there are times in my journey where I have come across similar ways of thinking. And I, I think it's a... Uh, it's something I, I wanted to mention here. A lot of people shy away from that because you, a lot of people seem to think that you can't accuse God. In my own experience, in my own experience, accusing him like the accuser did 
has only led to me coming closer to him. I think there's a reason why the accuser is mentioned in the Divine Council in Chapter 1. Um, he accuses God's uh, benevolence, I guess you could say. So it is Job. It's almost like there's a counterpart. <laughs> it's, it's, or, or, like a, or like a spiritual version of that accusation. And, uh, and I think, uh, but yet God listens to the accuser. And God listens to Job. Now, he reprimands him. And I'm sure with the whole accuser thing in the divine council, there's reprimand there. But he, he invites discussion. And he doesn't want us to be blind slaves, which is such a common misconception. And, the, and this is, I mean, it's right here. Like you can, if you don't see the biting sarcasm in that statement in, in uh, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 10, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I really don't. I think it comes across in pretty much every translation. Um, and there's more other places, but this is pretty direct. Um, and the, chapter 14. This is all about death, okay? This is him accusing. How frail is humanity, how short is life, how full of trouble. We blossom like a flower and then wither. Like a passing shadow, we quickly disappear. Must you keep an eye on such a frail creature and demand an accounting for me? Who can bring purity out of an impure person? No one. You've decided the length of our lives, so you know how many months we will live. We are not given a minute longer, so leave us alone and let us rest. (laughs) we're like higher hand so let us finish our work in peace even a tree has more help if it's cut down it'll sprout again and grow new branches a tree very interesting there so read that verse again it's a very interesting statement and it's interesting how it correlates to the Christian concept later on even a tree has more help if it's cut down it'll sprout again and grow new branches Though its roots have grown old in the earth, and its stump decays, at the scent of water it will bud and sprout again like a new seedling. But when people die, their strength is gone. They breathe their last, and then where are they? As water evaporates from a lake and a river disappears in drought, people are laid to rest and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not wake up and will be roused from their sleep. I wish you could hide me in the grave and forget me there until your anger has passed. But mark your calendar to think of me again. (laughs) Can the dead live again? If so, this would give hope. They give me hope through all my years of struggle, and I would eagerly await the release of death. You would call and I would answer, and you would yearn for me, your handiwork. But then you would guard my steps instead of watching for my sins. My sins would be sealed in a pouch, and he would cover my guilt. But instead, as mountains fall and crumble, and as rocks fall from a cliff, as water wears away the stones and blood washes away the soil, so you destroy people's hope. I'm sorry, that's like a very brazen statement. You always overpower them, and they pass from the scene. You disfigure them in death and send them away. They never know if their children grow up in honor or sink to significance. They suffer painfully. Their life is full of trouble. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of accusation. No clear-cut statement on life after death. They said, even then, you would give me hope. But no, all you do is destroy people. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> so, but again, I go back to my own experience. There have been times when I have got, I guess you could say, in English terms, I have gotten right in God's face a few times. And, uh, in a selfish way, more than likely in certain ways, uh, yes. I, don't, I was not there when the foundations of the earth were founded. I was not there when God said, let there be. You know what I mean. But the thing is, though, I did get up right in his face on 
probably a handful of occasions. And maybe a little, yeah, about a handful. And that I can name right off the bat. And these things, though, have always led, always led to a much deeper understanding of him and a much prof- more profound love for him. As long as I believe that accusation comes from a willingness to talk. All Job was doing was saying, talk to me, answer me. And, and <laughs> he did, which was <laughs> so, But all Job was asking was to talk to me. He was open to discussion. And I think as long as if we were to argue with God, I'm not saying go out and argue with God, <laughs> like, but I do think that God allows for it. And I do believe, from my own experience, that as long as we have that willingness to listen, that heart wanting to listen, that he that he allows it, um, and and that he and that he respects it. And it's funny to think that God respects us anyway. Like I'm still battling with that, like even myself. Anyway, so now it, it kind of goes back, uh, uh, like on and on. Um, but there's a thing in chapter 19 that, that I do want to mention because it was mentioned before, and I actually looked it up, um, and uh, I actually have a different way of looking at it. So uh, <laughs> it, now Daniel's different, but Job is not. And the, I don't think where it is. Okay. Uh, chapter 25, I'm uh, sorry, ver- chapter 19, verse 25. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, and in my body, I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. How dare you go on persecuting me, saying it's his own fault. He's talking to the person who was accusing him. It's funny. You've got the accuser accusing God. You've got Job accusing God, and then you've got other accusers accusing Job, thinking that they're defending God. Brain twister. But anyway, um, you should fear punishment yourselves. For your attitude deserves punishment, and you'll know that there is indeed a judgment. Now let's look at grammar. Does everybody have future tense? Um, in uh, verse 25, uh, it's present tense. That's my translation. And then after that, it's like future, future, future. He'll stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, in my body I shall see God. I will see him for myself. If I'll see him with my own eyes, I'm overwhelmed at the thought. So, uh, does everyone basically have that same type of uh, way of seeing it? Okay, let's take a look at it from a human perspective. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes, what? Yes, oh, I thought, I thought it was good. Sir, go ahead. Oh, I'm not oh, sure yeah. if you want me to repeat, but. Mine has those tenses. Uh, no, uh, what, the same tenses? Yes. Oh, okay. I, I thought you said that. I, I thought that you uh, unmuted because that they were uh, uh, different, which would have been cool because you have a more literal translation. Um, okay. You gotta understand grammar here is getting complex. So it's saying for I knew, this is a perfect tense. From this perspective, it's funny. It says for I know, it's actually no, it says for I have known that my redeemer, like I've always known this, uh, that my redeemer lives. And at last on earth he shall stand. Um, I'm gonna share the screen just in case uh, people can't see it on the future version. Um, so for I know this is it says the uh, call perfect the perfect is that that thing we've talked about before that means it's a it's a po- uh, uh, anterior motion like it's something that has happened from your perspective in the past 
and it's not a direct statement of something that happens as like a, as a general statement. This is a past inference. So I knew that my uh, that I have a uh, that there is a living redeemer, uh, and that uh, he stands at last on the earth. It's more of a future implication, or that he stands and will continue to stand. Um, so that after my skin is destroyed, I, uh, this, in my flesh, I see God. What happened to Job? Physically. His skin was destroyed. Exactly. Even though my skin is off, basically, I see God. Like, that's what he's saying. It's a mix of tenses. If you see here where it says imperfect, this is the yeek toll. The yeek toll is the thing that says general present statements or future statements. So that's why it's often translated as a future statement. But it's also language of the law, and it's also language of um, of common, uh, it's like our present progressive also. It can act as this. I am seeing God. Like my flesh, and this is the perfect sense, my flesh has been destroyed. In my flesh, I will see, uh, I am seeing God. And then you have in verse 27, whom I see now for myself and my eyes behold and doesn't yearn for anything else within me. Like, it's, it, 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 like, my heart, it, it, it's amazing that, like, we have the, and not a single one of our translations dares to translate it in the present tense. And it's, like, I, I think it's really fascinating. Um, let, me, let me try to uh, see if I can find the Wikipedia article on am told. Oh, that's great. Thoughts follow the source of Wikipedia. Oh, shush. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you know goes on there just to purposely <laughs> mess with? Um, uh, where do I start? <laughs> in the Hebrew grammar? In the well, middle of nowhere? Yeah, usually you can uh, pretty much guarantee that uh, scholarly sources are used here. Ah. Uh, That's the law of conjugation. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. There it is. I'm just looking here. That's modern Hebrew. Hold on, guys. Voice and mood, two conjugations, which may have indicated aspect and or tense matter debate. The tense or aspect of verbs is also influenced by conjugation. Well, the so-called uh, wild sensitive construction to follow where it was verbs of the object, verbs of the person. Uh, let's see, we need the verbs here. Verbs. All right. Uh, and two major conjuga uh, conjugations, prefixing, which is uh, the one I'm talking about is more the present, and then suffixing, which is more like the past. The meaning of the prefixing and suffixing conjugations are also affected by the conjugation, what, and their meaning with respect to tense and aspect is a matter of debate. Um, but the, the thing is that so you got the perfect, the simple past. <gasps> what? Or you have uh, the imper... Uh, no, that's not that one. And this is imperfect, present condition. 
An imperfect verb in the present, which implies that an action has been going on for some time, is still ongoing in the present, especially use the questions in the present, such as, what are you seeking? Or stick with present. An imperfect verb in the present, we're saying it's a great action in the present, it is being said in the city. My son makes his father glass. Um, and uh, this is, uh, it, it's really confusing and very, 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 very complicated. Like, I'm telling you that when it comes to, like, understanding Hebrew verbs, it is, you've got to bend your mind. And that's so when it comes to, um, but when it comes to this, to me, it's very clear. That when you're saying things like, um, let, me, let me give you an example. I'm going to go to uh, chapter 21. I can almost guarantee what verb structure it's going to be. So Job speaks. Okay. He says, listen, like now, do it now. It's imperative. Um, but then you have carefully to my speech and let this be your translation. Bear with me that I may speak imperfect. And after I have spoken, I keep my, hold on, I'm looking for like a, So why should that's a, I'm looking here. Uh, look at me and be okay. Look at me and be astonished. It's imperfect. It's uh, no, it's imperative. Sorry. Um, and even when I remember. I'm blind. It's gonna take a while because sometimes you gotta really dig here. Uh, oh, there it is. Why do the late wicked live? Imperative. I'm sorry, imperfect. I mix up the term. So why do the wicked live? So in, in, in verse 7, it's like, well, why do they live? And, and like, and, uh, and why do they become mighty in power? And are established, oh, that's participles. Oh, these participles are everywhere. They don't tell you anything about this time. Um, okay, uh, that's imperfect. Um, okay, so this is a general statement, right? So without failure, they're counting as calves, and without miscarriage. Uh, they send forth, so this is a general truth, right? Imperfect. Like a flock, their little ones and their children dance. Imperfect, right? So when you go back, So what happens in 19, you have imperfect. I am see, uh, I see for myself in my eyes, um, uh, this is the perfect. Have beheld, yeah, have beheld, and not another, for another have yearned uh, in my heart within me. But if you just go back to another verse, I'm sorry, for anyone who's, like, watching me as I'm rambling here, just please trust me when I'm saying this about, like, the, <laughs> the, the verb structure. And then in verse 26 of uh, chapter 19, and after my skin uh, has been destroyed because this is perfect, this I know that in my flesh I see God. This is a general truth. Like, it's a, it's a, like I still see, I see it now. And so I, I don't know if that makes it any clearer for those who are, like, in this room with me right now. So Mom and Linda, I don't know if that actually Mm -hmm. um, helps, like, with your understanding of what's being said here. But I did want to take that time out of the way to say this is something that actually doesn't come across in translations. <laughs> so, um, and the translation of Hebrew verbs is the bane of my existence. And <laughs> um, it is a very difficult uh, subject. Um, almost all of the course I'm doing right now has to deal with verbs. And, it, like, verbs are wonderfully messy. And, yeah, but when it comes to the perfect and imperfect, or the yitol and the katal, or I just flipped it. 
uh, the perfect is the catal, the, the imperfect is the equal. There's really no question when it comes to it is from your perspective, the catal is uh, from behind you, and the yigtol is either with you now or in front of you. And that's exactly what's happening here, is that, like, my flesh has drained away, uh, has fallen away, but I see God at this moment, and I shall continue to. So um, I don't know if that explains it even for people who are, uh, like, attending us online, um, but it is interesting. Um, Actually, in verse, I'm interested to see what verse 28 says. <clears throat> uh, how dare you go on persecuting? Hey, hey, if you say what shall we persecute, uh, like, it's imperfect. And look at your translation. It says, how dare you go on, like, uh, it's almost like the present perfect, right? You are doing this now. It's the same verb form that's used in previous verses, but that's translated as future. And it, it, it's like saying it's his own fault. <laughs> it's like I, I'm just baffled at, at, the, uh, at the unwillingness in terms of translation to see it from a perspective where it's, it, to me, have it, now, I'm not an expert in Hebrew. I've only been saying it for two years. But it's like, to me, it's rather indicative. And, and I think it's unfortunate. But anyway, so... That's why when we were talking about like uh, him saying like, well, I shall see God, it's like it doesn't necessarily say that <laughs> because that would be a disconnect from what he said in previous ver- uh, in chapters when he said how can, the, I, I would be of great help when I could uh, if I could know that I would be in front of you, but no, you just destroy people, and that would be a major disconnect there. So um, anyway, does anyone have anything to share on that one before we move on? We're almost done with Job actually. I did want to focus on that. Okay. Uh, Chapter 38. When God uh, talks here, uh, this is definitely the ancient concept of the foundation of the world. And I have come across uh, Christian traditions that, that, that the, the closest I can get to a representation, a, a, an adequate and an honest and fair representation is when you look outside, you say the sun's rising, you know that the sun's not rising, right? Uh, and, and it's like the... I'm, try, I'm, I'm refraining from the scientific concept of things, but, like, but today, in a modern perspective, you know that the sun doesn't rise, but we still say it's part of our language, right? I think we, as, as modern-day Christians, don't give the grace in terms of what the ancients saw, um, and that they honestly, fervently believe this. And honestly, God works with our preconceived notions. He works with them. And I, and I think that he definitely, when he made his case to Job, he could, uh, dude, like, he, he, it, any worldview, he could have said very similar things, uh, just, just in a slight different twist based on, on the understanding of the people at the time. So, <laughs> I love that verse for you, though. Brace yourself like a man, because <laughs> I have some questions for you. <laughs> you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And it's actually saying, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And, um, and the morning stars sang together. So, hmm. Anyway, and the stars shall be there for signs. But anyway, um, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And as the womb, and as I closed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, or I locked it. We're talking about locking away at sea. Am I a sea monster that we locked away? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. 
I said this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud ways must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath the steel. It is robed in brilliant colors. Uh, anyway, so you, you get where I'm going at. This is just definitely the, um, yeah, it's like, uh, and it's like it's talking about constellations. And the, the constellations being there for signs, seasons, and, uh, what was it, signs, seasons? But that was in Genesis, even. But fine. Mm. But yet the stars sing. Mm. Definitely, uh, just reiterating, stars are seen as divine beings in ancient thought. Um, all right. <laughs> it goes on for a while. Uh, but I did want to talk about when Job actually... Retorts. I think it's like oh yeah here um, verse 5 of chapter 42 I only heard about you before but now I've seen you with my own eyes I take back everything I said and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance it's interesting here um and, and he basically puts uh, Eliphaz in his place and all the other guys. But there's an interesting section. Uh, just remember that Elihu has uh, more than likely been inserted. But Elihu seems to be like the, uh, it's almost like Christ himself, the way he talks. Um, it's interesting. Um There's correlation in 41, 1 to 4 to, uh, to other creation stories. Um, can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity? Will it agree to work for you to be your slave for, uh, for life? Can you make it a pet like a bird or give it to your little girls to play with? Will merchants try to buy it to sell it in their shop? Will its hide be hurt by spears or its head by a harpoon? It, like, and this is like this is definitely a correlation to ancient ways of thinking. Um, in terms of like you have like these different stories of like these demigods like like wrangling like these massive creatures and stuff like that. And um, anyway, Job, Job says something, and I totally uh, there's a section. Uh, hold on. Oh, no, that was what it was. Yeah, when he said he, he had seen him with his own eyes. There's something else there. Um, that's basically, I, I thought it was interesting, too, that he had, like, seven sons and three daughters. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Can we get <laughs> um, so uh, there's something I just I know I'm missing something, but I'm sure I'll just find it before next week. Um, it's interesting he lived 140 years. The <laughs> uh, living, uh, after that, uh, living to see four generations of his four generations, the third and fourth. But like, uh, but the thing is, though, it's like you see God relent, uh, like in terms of that. Anyway, <laughs> then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. And we are almost done for tonight. But um, Job is extremely profound. Uh, I, I, I do hope that like going over it in this short expanse of time opens new doors and ways of understanding. Uh, when it comes to looking at Job as genuine uh, wisdom literature. Um, oh, and it talks about also when Job comes back to God, he says to me about wisdom. Like in 42, he says, I know you can do anything and no one can stop you. You ask to this you question my wisdom question, right? It's I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, 
things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I'd only heard about you before. Um, oh, wait, no, it just made me right before that. You just said something about wisdom. You said something like you are of wisdom. Well, see, I am like losing it. Yeah, because like Joe basically says that like, I'm blown away by your wisdom. I love this one though. Um, I love how before we began, but do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You're God's critic, but do you have the answers? And then the joke says, nope, I have nothing more to say. And then God goes, oh, but we have one. <laughs> it's like, raise yourself like a man because here comes part two. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I just saw it, like where he was talking about, like, I, I am just blown away by your wisdom, and I just lost with it. Oh, there it is. Uh, verse three. Of 42, who is this that questions my wisdom with such a hand? Sorry, I, I just breezed over that. I must be getting tired. Um, that's, uh, that's all I got on Joe. Does anyone have anything they wanted to say uh, before I end with a few uh, general comments about what we're going to be covering later? Um, next is Song of Songs. Uh, three general ways to look at that book are um, the, the general idea of this is just how a man really truly can love a woman and a woman love it. Like the, the interplay between like uh, an actual like husband and wife or like future husband and wife. Two is how the Jewish perspective of the woman being God and that she or a godly person I guess you could say uh, like she going back and I would say God though because the Jewish perspective really is God that you have lady wisdom like you have God as wisdom but then lady uh, folly makes a few entrances it, it, it's weird. It's like you have like this weird blurring of the lines, um, and uh, and then like chasing after this person who wants to be with her, um, and then you have the Christian perspective, which is that uh, the man is Christ and the woman is the church. Uh, I think that all three of these um, have validity. I think it's really interesting and mind bending to look at, well, I think what's interesting is how all of them work. <laughs> it, it, that, that's a really interesting one. You also have, uh, um, is it Ruth after this? Let me take a look. I think it's Ruth after this. I'm, I'm going based on the general Jewish way of things. Yeah, it is uh, the Song of Songs. Uh, so the three poetic books were Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. You already see the, the poetry just oozing out of Job. Um, Song of Songs, Ruth, will be next. That's a short one, but there are some really cool things in there. Uh, I remember we started, or we ended, I forget, like one of my Hebrew classes, we spent like weeks on Ruth. That was cool. Because Ruth is like the easiest Hebrew book to read um, in terms of biblical books. It's, it's very simple. Um, and Lamentations is next and then Ecclesiastes, and then Esther. Uh, when we're done with those, Daniel is going to throw us for a loop. And then we have Ezra, and Chron uh, Ezra, which is combined as Ezra and Nehemiah, and then you have Chronicles. Now, a few, few notes about these are going to be interesting. Uh, everyone who knows anything really about like uh, uh, books of the Bible, Esther is the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God. Um, which is well known. Um, Daniel is out of, uh, so we're talking about Job being like unique for its own reason. Yeah, Daniel is like on another playing field. 
And uh, so Daniel, right now, we're going to see is pretty much one of the only places where it does talk about, like, life after death. In the last verse. But anyway. <laughs> in, the, in the last verse. What about Job? It, Job talked about life after death. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Right? <laughs> right? So, he talks um, about that. You're being jokeful, right? No. No, we just covered we, that text. Yeah, okay, forget it. I'll I'll let it go. I, uh, <laughs> it's the no, it progressive, said, but he will... Okay, I'll go. Let it go. Let it go. It's like, it would be, or I see God would be a better way to say Yeah, it. I know. Because I know. My body has wasted away. But, I'm but still I still see at, at God. I, I have my eyes. Yeah. God. Yeah. Like it's like it's like that meaning, and that my. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and read through the whole book because I think there's a few other references I don't remember off the top yeah. of my head. Think about it. What does he say immediately after that statement? Is you have him saying, "So how dare you tell me that it's my fault because my eyes are always on him," and, and so that's what he's basically saying. Yeah. Okay. I think there's one place where he talked about waiting for his change. Yeah, Being waiting for my change to come. Right. Uh, you talked about he, he was okay. going to go to the grave. He was, he was I, gonna, will stop. I don't but, want to go but, off on a tangent, Joel. I'm just, is the last verse of Daniel. Well, yeah, that, that does okay. say it there. But there's a lot of other inferences. I think if you went through... I'd have to go, I'm going to read through the Bible again and see how many places where it doesn't directly say things, but it's inferring it. Yeah, but then you have, like, in the New Testament where it doesn't infer it anymore. <laughs> it doesn't what? And then you have the New Testament where it doesn't infer it anymore. Oh, no, it comes from I, blatant. I go back to why is it that the Sadducees honestly didn't believe in life after death. So... But uh, one thing about uh, somebody that we're talking about Daniel, like the one really clear-cut example, and that's I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Like if, if something is, I will gladly admit it. I have, I have admitted that before. Um, but the last verse of Daniel is that one clear-cut thing about it where he says, no, go your yeah. way until the end of time and rise again. Um, and then you have Ezra and Nehemiah. The really cool thing about this, and I didn't realize this until we were doing our Bible read through last year. Um, and then I looked it up and I'm like, yeah, this is interesting. Not a single time. No. So you have Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're going to really focus on this, but it just baffles me that Ezra and Nehemiah is more like a warning, um, saying, don't do things because you think God wants this. Like, they never consult him. They just do, thinking that God wants. And th this is a huge, huge issue. Because Nehemiah says, oh, God, please remember me because I did all of this for you. And it's, it's uh, but never does he consult the Lord. Never. He just says, oh, I see this law, and we have to do this, and we got to do all these things. But he never consults. And so it, it's really fascinating. So, um, and then you have Chronicles, which is kind of like the roundup. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We're, we're basically halfway through the, the Jewish year. We are of a year with 13 months, uh, but uh, the year ends the week before April. So that will be be interesting to see what we, how we get, how, where we go. All right, anything else before we go? I have no... Okie dokie. No, you didn't say it right now. <laughs> um, all right. Let's go ahead and give it to him. Father, thank you. This is honestly out of this world, an awesome, awesome gathering that we have here, that we really do, like, look at things from different perspectives, that we really do work hard to destroy the barriers that we've so that we've been that we don't even realize exist. And we Father, we thank you for, for turning us back with our gaze truly on you in this. 
um, looking for you and trying to find you and, and, and really honestly searching instead of doing what we think you want us to do. But yet we continue to come and, and, and look at you and, and listen to your wisdom and listen to you calling for us in the streets and listen to you, um, to you wanting us to come closer and just, and just love, love, like love you and because of your love for us. This is truly outstanding and extremely humbling to be part of a group like this. Never in my life have I ever done this. And I, and I dare say that none of us have, none of us have ever been. So thank you. Um, we, we just run at you with open arms. And we know that you always have yours around us. So we ask for your grace and love and just that womb-like compassion that it never died. Thank you. For my In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.